I'm Dave Rush, and you're watching Western Bass TV. I'm not used to fishing for largemouth when I can't see them real well. well good afternoon and welcome to the International Sportsman's Expo, day two of our four-day stop here in Sacramento. For those of you gathered around the Calmodia Aquarium Demonstration Tank, we want to remind you that uh, we've got a lot of great literature over on the table. Make sure you pick up some of that. I also want to remind you, when you're out on the water, to wear your life jackets, keep your kill switches attached, much like we do. Uh, anytime we're fishing, anytime we have our outboards running, uh, four, four out of every ten deaths are anglers on the water, so we want to, uh, want to remind you how important that is. Cal Bodie wanted to get the word across to you on that. For those of you gathered around our aquarium tank, we bring this tank in empty uh, from Texas. We park it, fill it up full of water. Hey, it's like the Shamu show. Wait till Dave falls in. Um, <laughs> nice, David. We bring the tank in empty. He'll bring an intro to a dead stop every time. Fill it up full of water, and these fish are all on load from the California Department of Fish and Game. We do have a fish in the tank that uh, is right at 10 pounds. In case you've seen the biggest fish in there and you think that's a 10-pounder, you're a little off. The biggest fish in the tank, I believe she was down here somewhere, is uh, right here, right by the stump. It's 14 and a half pounds. So you guys get an opportunity to see that one. Wanted to point her out. Um, that is the star of the show, our 14 and a half pound largemouth, the co-star of the show. Uh, he's weighing in, and it just a little over. Oh no, you don't like me to do that part, do you? He's uh, careful what you do. He, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's been my buddy for a long time. Dave and I, uh, Dave and I, spent an awful lot of time designing lures for one particular lure company a few years ago. We've uh, spent quite a little bit of time fishing together. Um, some great experiences, let me tell you. We've uh, we've pushed the bass boat about three miles over sandbars at one time or another. Uh, uh, we've done a few a few things like that, but uh, Dave is considered one of the top spotted bass anglers really in the country, not only here in the West. He's uh, won two boats up on Lake Orville last year. He won the Angler's Choice uh, stop at Lake Orville. He also won their championship up there as well. He's a past uh, Western uh, Classic champion with one bass and also a uh, champion on the one bass Tri-States. Qualified for the Red Man All-American. Um, awesome fisherman, one of the best spotted bass fishermen around. Put your hands together and welcome from beautiful downtown Palermo, California, Mr. Dave Rush. Thank you. Well, the sad news about this seminar is, is I can't fish because there's no spotted bass in here. But we'll have to use our imagination on these fish. First thing is, let's see a show of hands and how many people know how to tell the difference between a spotted bass and a largemouth? A few of you? I mean, it, they, they really look really similar. I mean, you, you could hold them side by side, and a lot of the times you can't tell the difference. The easiest way to tell that you've caught a spotted bass instead of a largemouth is when you hold that fish, hold him by his bottom lip, so he opens his mouth, and you look in his mouth, and in the center of his tongue, he's gonna have a little dark patch. And what that dark patch is, is that's actually a set of teeth. You can take your finger and you can reach in there and rub and it'll be real rough. They're really sharp teeth. Large mouth don't have that. Small mouth bass do not have that. Spotted bass is the only one that has that. And it's basically there. They're like a nomad fish. They roam a lot. They chase bait quite a bit and it helps them catch fish and hang on to them. That's the easiest way. The other way is where the gill plate is. It's in front of their little side fin. A large mouth, their gill plate actually goes back to the side fin. So those are a couple of ways. The next time you're out fishing and you're not real sure whether you're catching large mouth or spotted bass, that's the easiest way to check for those two ways. Probably the most common technique and tackle used for spotted bass is spinning gear. When I'm spotted bass fishing, probably 80% of the time, I'm gonna have a spinning rod in my hand. If I'm not throwing reaction baits or dragging a jig, I'm gonna be throwing a spinning rod. I'll either be drop shotting, 
dart heading or shaking worms. This particular rig is probably one of the things I always start out with first thing in the morning. Winter time, what's unique about spotted bass is they're really active in the winter. Large mouth, the colder the water gets, the more dormant they go. They don't have to feed as often as spotted bass. A large mouth metabolism slows down when the water dips down into the below 50. He'll feed maybe once every week or two weeks. A spotted bass is going to feed every day, if not twice a day. Right now we had a tournament up at Lake Oroville. The water temperature at Lake Oroville is 47 degrees. My partner and I, we would go out each day in the tournament and we would catch like 30 or 40 fish a day. Now granted, they all weren't keepers, but we did catch quite a few fish and that shows you how active they are. We did not catch a single largemouth in those two days of competition. I practiced the tournament for like three days prior to the tournament. I caught one largemouth in three days of practice. And the long and short is, is I spent five days on the water and caught one largemouth. But I probably caught well over a hundred spotted bass. That's the neat thing about spotted bass, is they're really active in the winter and we get to fish for them and have the lake to ourselves. We don't have jet skis out there, we don't have water skiers, we don't have a bunch of pleasure boaters out there. We kind of get the run of the whole lake. So that's why I really enjoy fishing for them. I'd rather fish for spotted bass than largemouth just in the winter for that simple reason. The activity level and we get to have the lake to ourselves. This particular bait I'm throwing right now is called a zipper grub. Like I say, I'm going to start out my day normally. If I don't have any wind or anything and it's flat calm, I like to try a subtle approach. But the difference is, is the first thing people think about when they're winter fishing for bass is they automatically think deep. I've got to fish really deep. Well, a lot of times, spotted bass don't play by the rules. They don't own the playbook we have, and they do things a little different. Although that water temperature may be 48 or 47 degrees, there are a certain number of fish that are going to be shallow first thing in the morning, at first light. And like I say, if there's no wind or anything and it's kind of flat, calm or whatnot, one of the first things I'm going to throw is a dart head and I'm either going to have this zipper grub on it or a tube or a curl tail grub. I really like this zipper grub. It comes it's put out by Robo. They make a lot of neat colors. I kind of keep my color base really simple. I like to stick with earth tones or as natural as possible. I like the greens, the browns, and some shad colors. I don't get too crazy on colors when I'm throwing like a bottom dragon bait and I consider it like dart head fishing, dragging the bottom. Now there are times that you will go on the other end of the scale and get really loud and bright, and I'll get into that in just a second. But the unique thing about this zipper grub is it's a little paddle tail grub. It's about three and a half inches long. And when it's molded, they put a groove in the tail, and you're actually able to pull the tail apart, which kind of creates a pincher effect like a crawdad and it really increases the action. And there's a couple of favorite forages of spotted bass. One's, needless to say, either threadfin or pond smell. The other one is crawdads. And there's one that a lot of people don't really hear about a whole lot or talk about, and that's a sculpin. And all our bodies of water have sculpin in them. And all that is is a freshwater rock bass. And they, the average one runs between three and four inches. And this is a perfect replica of it. And what that little sculpin does, and I'm a firm believer that these spotted bass prefer the sculpin over the bait fish because there's more nutrients in them. And they'd rather eat a crawdad than bait fish. Therefore, a lot of times when you're fishing the bottom, you catch larger spotted bass versus drop shot or throwing shad imitations. Now there is an exception to the rule and that's the big spots that are up on top feeding on trout. But sculpin and crayfish 
This is what this particular bait imitates really well. When I fish it, first thing in the morning, I'm going to throw it right up on the bank. If not up on the bank, I'll throw it in a foot of water. And what I'll do, very important in the winter, and I will stress this to you, how important it can be. Never start lifting the bait up off the bottom. Anytime that water is 52 or colder, I want to keep that bait on the bottom. Because your crayfish, your sculpin, all your forage isn't going to hop around and dance off the bottom. The water's real cold, everything's real lethargic. So I like to keep this bait on the bottom. I'll rig this zipper grub on like six pound test, P line, and I'm going to go into fishing lines a little bit. Copolymer lines are more sensitive than straight monofilament, which is very important. It may not be that important when I'm fishing real shallow, but as soon as I start dropping down into 30, 50, and 60 foot, I want as much sensitivity as I can get. In the last couple of years, I've played around with straight copolymer lines and then started throwing some fluorocarbon lines, floral clear line. I'm pretty much dead set on fluorocarbon line now. It is more sensitive than the standard copolymer lines. And the other great benefit to fluorocarbon is it's invisible. Once it enters the water, it's virtually invisible to the fish. So I get the stealthiness of they can't see the line, and then I get the benefit of the extra sensitivity of it. I fish a lot of light line for spotted bass. Anytime I'm throwing a spinning rod, I normally don't go over eight pound test, just for manageability. And I feel I get a lot more strikes with the lighter line. The bait has a lot more action and it's more sensitive to me. I'll fish this on like a 3 16th to a quarter ounce dart head or a round head. Again, winter time, I'll keep it just dragging right on the bottom. And one of the biggest problems we have in the winter when we start fishing is if we get a little bit of breeze and we start fishing deeper, we lose contact with our bait. And what happens is we've all been taught to do this. We fish our rod from like 9 to 11 o'clock. Well, if it's windy and I have 12 foot of line exposed from the tip of my rod to the water, I lose sensitivity. That wind's blowing against that line, I lose my touch. So what I like to do anytime that there's wind is I'll take my rod and point it towards the water and I'll cut that by two thirds of line exposed to the air. So I get my sensitivity. This also helps me keep the bait on the bottom and I'll fish it a sideways action. I'll kind of sweep it to the side and help keep that bait on the bottom and keep the sensitivity for me. Now, if there's no wind, I do like to fish it from 9 to 11, and I am a staunch line watcher. Very important. A lot of times spotted bass, you don't feel them. I like to make a toss out, let the bait fall on a slack line. I'll watch that slack line. As soon as the line where it enters the water quits moving, and that's very important because that's where you want to watch for a strike, is where that line enters the water you watch that little V that the line makes. Then you'll know your bait is on the bottom. When that line quits moving and there's no more rings, your bait's on the bottom. And I'll sit there and I'll watch that ring just for a little bit because a lot of times, if I make a cast in deeper water and that bait falls by a fish, spotted bass are notorious followers. They'll follow that bait down, it'll sit there, they're kind of like a cat, they can't stand it, they'll grab it. And a lot of times you'll see that strike where your line enters the water. You'll see that little twitch. When you're bit with spotted bass, unlike largemouth, you don't want to drop your rod and swing away. I have the toughest time sometimes in these tournaments when we're fishing Shasta or Oroville or Folsom or even Berryessa. I'll draw somebody in the tournament and they'll get bit and they'll immediately do this. They'll jerk. Again, spotted bass are notorious for short biting. I like to refer to a spotted bass kind of like a house cat. Everybody that has a cat that stays in the house, 
they take a piece of yarn and they kind of drag it around on the carpet and that cat starts crouching and stalking it. I believe that's what spotted bass do a lot of the time. Whether it's even on a crankbait or a rip bait or a bait dragged on the bottom. They'll actually follow that bait for a little ways. So what happens is they'll come up behind it and they'll grab the tail of that grub or worm or jig or whatever and they're just kind of testing the water. They'll just come up, bite it, and throw it down. They won't take the whole bait. Well, what happens, as soon as I feel that bite or see that strike, if I give it one of these and pop it, and there's any type of water clarity, you know, to where it's not crystal clear, I'm liable to move that bait four or five foot away from that fish, and he may lose interest in it. But if you set the hook with what I call a reel set, and that's where, if I'm bit, all I do is I raise up and I feel that fish a little bit, I'm just gonna start spinning the reel as fast as I can and wait till that rod loads up before I give him a little tug. Because if he just has the tail of that bait and I go to lift up, I'm able to start reeling. As soon as he lets go, I can stop and give it all right back to him. And nine times out of 10, he's gonna follow that bait right to the bottom and if he doesn't grab it as soon as it's on the bottom, the first little bit of movement I make with it, whether I shake it or drag it, he'll hop on it. Very important, I'll do that with any of the plastics I throw. I even do that with jig fishing. I like to throw a medium light rod, six and a half to seven foot long, and six pound test, yes sir. The dart head itself is like 3 16th to a quarter. I like to throw the 3 16th ounce. I'll throw that from like zero to say 20. Once I start going past 20 foot, I'll step it up to like a quarter ounce dart head. Now, dart heads are great. I always fish them open hook. They're not weedless. If I come into a situation to where I start coming into bushes and stumps and I have to throw weedless, what I'll do is I'll throw basically a medium to medium light spinning rod again with either six or eight pound test, fluorocarbon line. It'll be P line. It's the one downfall we used to have with fluorocarbon lines is they really weren't abrasion resistant. And P lines kind of address that problem and their fluorocarbon line is fairly tough. I feel it's tougher than the others out there and I've had really good success with it. I'm going to throw this on either six or eight pound test. I like a 3 16th ounce bullet weight, even if I'm fishing in the shallows. Now, if I start getting a bunch of short strikes where the fish really don't hit it hard, that's when I'll go with a lighter weight. I'll throw like an eighth or a 16th. But 80% of the time, I would throw a 3 16th ounce bullet weight and this Texas rig, I'll throw bigger worms a lot of times. In tournament fishing, we're always trying to catch a better size fish. And spotted bass really school up. They run in little wolf packs. There's not a whole lot of loners. And what happens, I feel, a lot of times in the spotted bass world is when we're throwing our smaller baits and we're catching fish after fish, it's not because all those fish are the same size it's the smaller ones are quicker than the bigger ones. So a lot of times if I could throw a little larger bait and detour the smaller fish from biting, it'll give that larger fish a chance to eat it. And that goes true with the dart head. I have no problem with throwing that six inch worm on that dart head, trying to catch a better sized fish. But anytime I start getting around wood, cockle burrs or a bunch of weeds, I'll have to go to a Texas rig I'm gonna fish it the same way as that dart head. I'm gonna to try to keep it on the bottom. I'm not gonna to try to jerk it around or raise it off the bottom or anything. In the winter time, very important to keep it right on the bottom. I like to fish it just like I said. I'll point that rod tip towards the water and fish it sideways. And what'll happen is, we, even with this Texas rig, you know, we've all been taught in the old school when we get bit on a Texas rig worm, we got to point the rod to it, reel down, swing to the moon. 
I don't do that with spotted bass. Again, it doesn't matter that the hook's not exposed, he'll hang on to it. And if he only has the tail and he lets go, I want to be able to drop it right back and keep that bait in front of him and keep working it to draw a strike. If I get bit, all I'm going to do is reel and I'm going to wait till that rod loads up a little bit. And I don't mean the rod has to load up to here before I swing. As soon as I feel the weight of that fish, I'll give him a snap and then start reeling him in. The colors that I like to throw in the worms, the same as a grub. I'm kind of an earth tony deal. I like to keep it all natural unless I have really dirty water. Then I'll start going to something real bright. Either pink worms, chartreuse worms work well. You know, spotted bass, they, they live at each end of the scale of the food chain. I mean, they want it really natural or they want it obnoxiously loud. Everybody's heard about drop shot. Really great technique to catch lots of fish. A lot of times people will get on this bite and they can't catch better quality fish. I'm a firm believer in the spotted bass world that there's two categories of fish, or actually there's three. The better quality spots live one of two places. They're either on the bottom, eating crawdads or the sculpin, or they're cruising the surface, eating trout, one place or the other. All your schoolie size spotted bass, like the pound, pound and a halfers, they're what I call the bait chasers. Their main forage is thread fan or pond smelt. And a lot of times what happens is when we start drop shotting, we mark these fish on our meters. We'll drive around the lake and we'll use our locators and what we'll see is big balls of bait. And then we'll see fish all around them. And then we'll start drop shotting. And then we'll just start catching fish after fish. And then we don't catch any good ones. Well, what happens is, is you're throwing a shad colored worm because you're trying to match the forage. Well, that's fine. And in tournaments, it's very important to have a limit of fish. We want to catch as many fish as possible. But what I don't want to do is miss the opportunity to catch that better quality fish. Well, I can't very well fish a drop shot bait up on the surface, but I can fish one right next to the bottom and have it imitate a sculpin or a crayfish. And that's what I do. When I drop shot, I normally have two hooks on my rig. I'll run one anywhere from three to five foot up from the bottom. That's going to be my first hook. That's where I'm going to put like a hologram shad or a prism shad bait. You know, something that resembles the bait fish. And then just above my drop shot weight, I'm going to put either like a warm mouth color or a green, either Aaron's Magic or an all you color, which represents a sculpin. That way I get to catch both ends of the spectrum. I'm not going to miss. I'm still going to catch my bait chasers, the smaller fish, to fill out my limit, but I'm not going to miss the opportunity to catch that better quality fish, which might help me move up in a tournament to win more money. When I drop shot, I'll throw a six pound fluorocarbon line. A lot of times people have a lot of trouble with line twist. And what happens when you fish your drop shot, normally you're fishing an exposed hook. And what everybody does is they hook their bait right through the nose that's the normal procedure and we get a lot of line twist and we get it from two places one we get it from when we're dragging the weight along the bottom the other place we get the line twist is when we reel in the bait as you reel that bait in quick those worms want a helicopter and that'll twist up your line if you can refrain from burning that bait in you know you see your buddy in the back of the boat catch a fish and your first reaction is to reel it in real quick and throw back where he was so you could catch one. All you need to do is just slow down a little bit, let those baits kind of keel and come in and not twist up. The other way to help take away line twist when you drop shot is always buy a drop shot weight that has a swivel in it. That way that weight can roll along the bottom. I see people all the time, they get in my boat and I, they do what I call their cheating when they drop shot. 
they'll take a split shot, they'll crimp it on the bottom, or they'll take a bullet weight and put it on there and break a toothpick off and hold it. That doesn't ha let that line spin freely. It'll twist your line up for you. But if you buy one of these drop shot weights that have a swivel, that helps eliminate that line twist. There's one other thing that you can do to help eliminate line twist, and it's also gonna help you catch a few more fish, and that's wacky rigging bait. And when we talk about wacky rigging, we take our plastic bait, instead of hooking it through the nose, we're gonna hook it right in the center of the worm. And what that does is when we reel this bait in, this worm will collapse and it won't give it the opportunity to helicopter and twist our line up. And it also, a lot of times, adds a little different action. If I'm fishing in a tournament and I happen to be in a bay or on a point where everybody's drop shotting and that seems to be like the only bite, one of the first things I'll do is I'll start wacky rigging my baits because I want that bait to be a little bit different. Instead of that bait being nose hook and swimming along, when I wacky rig it and start shaking it around, that bait will actually dart side to side. Instead of just giving it a little swimming action, it'll kind of jerk back and forth. Kind of like a, a sluggo or a fluke. And a lot of times you'll catch a few more fish. If you're in an area and you have your bait rigged normal, and you catch a few fish that quit biting, start wacky rigging it, you'll get a few more bites. Now when I drop shot, I'm gonna do the same thing when I set the hook. I'm gonna reel set. Number one rule you never do when you're drop shotting is drop your rod and set the hook. A couple of reasons. Nine times out of 10, you're using real light line. You're using six or eight pound test line and we're fishing really small hooks. I normally throw like a size one or a one-aught hook when I drop shot. And if I jerk and pull real hard, chances are I'm gonna break my line or rip the hook right out of the fish's mouth. I don't even have points on these hooks. And you saw how long he hung on to it. Well, that's kind of explains what happens when you're spotted bass fishing and you do that real hook set. As soon as that fish bites that bait, he has the tip of that hook in his mouth. All I have to do is just get a little bit of pressure on him and that hook starts going in his mouth. So when I drop shot, all I'm gonna do is lift up, I feel the weight of the fish, I just start reeling. That's all I do. The only time that I will give it a little pop or a snap is if for some reason I'm drop shotting around weeds or brush and I have these baits Texas rig and I might need to get that hook out of that plastic a little bit. The first mistake I made when I started drop shotting is I didn't have the proper rod to use. All my rods were like medium light to medium and the ideal drop shot rod is a rod that has a really good tip. This rod would probably be a good trout rod. It's really limber. What that acts as is that's almost like a strike indicator. Because when we drop shot, the majority of the time, we're doing it in deep water. We're 30 to 60 foot. Even with everything in my favor, I'm using copolymer line, I'm using light line. A lot of times, you can't feel that fish bite. And how I'll know I'm bit, is I'll raise up and I'll watch. I know that, say, just a little bit of bend, that's my weight, and I watch that rod tip and all of a sudden it does this. Liter you can literally see that fish swimming with the bait. I can't feel him, he can't feel me, but that limber rod tip is telling me that something's down there swimming around with it, and that's when I'll go ahead and do the reel set on him. One of the biggest problems that people have with drop shotting is like, what do I, how do I store this when I move from spot to spot? There's a couple of easy ways. Some rods actually come with clips now attached that you can clip your weight to. If your rod doesn't have that, 
the simplest thing you can do if you have a spinning rod is just take your weight and put it right where your line comes off the spool where your bale is and just store it right there really simple you don't have to buy anything else they do sell neat little neoprene rubber band deals that you can put your weights on that works great if you have a bait caster and you drop shot with a bait caster all you do is you just take this weight and you drop it right in between the handle and the star drag and that'll hold that weight right there so those are a couple little handy hints that you can use when you're drop shotting again very important to have a real limber rod when you drop shot i'm a firm believer in the copolymer line for sensitivity and visibility and again don't set the hook that was my biggest mistake i made when i first started drop shot one of my other favorite baits i throw a lot in the winter time for spotted bass is a jig now when we first thing we think about when we start talking about jig fishing is we think about those guys back east we're pitching jigs flipping jigs and everything that's nothing like fishing a jig for spotted bass on like Lake Shasta, Folsom, or Oroville. The jig that I throw is a little bit different than the jig they fish back there in that heavy cover. This jig's a football head style jig, which basically that's what the head is shaped like, a football. Why I like this is all the weight of the jig is forward. Helps me keep in bottom contact. It also creates the most commotion and disturbs the bottom the most as I'm dragging it along. If I'm in a muddy area, this is gonna kick up a lot of silt. And it's almost gonna act as if a crawdad swimming along the bottom or one of those sculpin are swimming along the bottom. The other neat thing about this is when that jig hits the bottom, that hook is at a 90 degree angle. No matter what kind of lousy cast I make or what I do to screw it up, that jig is gonna fall and that hook is gonna be at a 90 degree angle. It's gonna be in a stinging position. So if that fish comes up behind it and bites it, and I set the hook on him, he's gonna have the hook in the toughest part of his nose. I like to throw a lot of plastic trailers with my jigs for a couple of reasons. It used to be, we always used to have to throw pork in the winter time with jigs because that gave the bait more lifelike attraction. Well, nowadays, plastics are so soft, they're loaded with salt, they're loaded with garlic and different flavors. It's really neat to be able to have that extra added attractant to the bait. It's really pliable. The other neat thing is that I like to throw double tails or a single tail grub on the back of my jig because that jig actually swims. And a lot of times you'll make a cast with that jig and those fish will be suspended. All of a sudden this jig swims through them real quick, gets their attention, they'll follow it to the bottom. Now when I go to drag it, those two little swim tails or that single tail grub kind of dust and stir up the bottom a little extra along with that football head jig. The other neat thing that I like about plastic trailers if I'm throwing this brown jig and I catch a few fish and I'm still marking fish in the area, the first thing I'm going to do is grab some chartreuse ribbon dye or a chartreuse marker and I'm going to color the tails chartreuse. Remember how I said these fish like it real natural or they like it real extreme or loud? I'll color the tails chartreuse and what this does is almost acts as if I've turned the emergency flashers on on this jig. It'll liven up the back of that jig. It'll amplify every movement of that jig. Every time I drag it or shake it, now I've got two little chartreuse tail lights out there waving around like road flares. What'll happen is if I'm fishing a particular rock pile, I catch three or four fish, all of a sudden they get conditioned to that brown on brown jig I throw a bit of a little different color in there, something bright, it'll trigger a few more strikes. Now I'll do this with the jig trailers, I'll do it with my zipper grub, I'll even do it with drop shot. 
any time that I want to add a little extra flash to it, or the fish seem to have slowed down a little bit, I'll add that chartreuse. Fish in this jig, I'm going to do it just like that Texas rig worm or that dart head. Winter time, I'm going to keep it on the bottom. The slower I can fish this jig, the better. Anytime I come up against something, like a stump or a rock, what I want to do is I want to take that jig and I just want to shake it. I don't want to pull it right over that piece of structure right away. Because a lot of times, say that stump is in the lake there, that fish will be laying right under that stump. And if I can position that on one side of that stump and start shaking that jig, I'll get his attention and all of a sudden I'll pop it up and over, he'll wheel around and look at it. If he doesn't strike it right away, as soon as I shake it or go to drag it a little bit, he'll pop it. The type of banks that I like to fish these jigs on are what we call like clay and cobble. Any time that I have clay banks with a little bit of broken rock, it's perfect crawdad habitat and it's a perfect area to fish jigs. My favorite way to fish them is what I call a controlled drift. And a controlled drift is basically where I use my trolling motor and I'm faced into the wind, but I'm actually fishing backwards. I'm going to take the jig, I'm going to throw it up on a point or in a cut or a pocket or a flat, and I'm going to let that wind literally push my boat backwards or sideways. And what this does is this keeps me in contact with that bait all the way. I'm not raising that rod up and down. I'm not engaging the reel and reeling at all. That wind's pushing my boat back. I'm using the trolling motor to control my drift to keep my bait right on the bottom. And as soon as I get a strike, I'm going to raise up and wait for the pressure, start reeling and set the hook. I raise up, he lets go of it. All I do is just drop that jig right back to him, shake it a little bit. I can hold the boat into the wind and I can keep that jig right there where I got that first strike and keep shaking that bait until that fish comes and eats it. The neat thing about winter time with spotted bass is we don't have to just fish bottom dragon baits, dart heads, or worms. Again, they're really active in the winter. In 47 degree water, they'll chase reaction baits. Whether it's a spinner bait, rip bait, crank bait. If I pull up to the lake and it's stormy out, the wind's blowing pretty good, one of the first baits I'll grab is a spinner bait. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw that right up into the shallows, right up on the bank, and I'm just going to do what you call a slow roll. I'm actually going to try to keep that spinner bait just like those jigs dragging along the bottom and bumping into everything. Except I'm going to be able to do it a little bit faster than I would with those plastics and jigs. I'm going to cover a little bit more ground. Very important at first light, they're real, they'll are real. they be up shallow. And if there's a little bit of chop on the water, chances are I can get them to strike a spinner bait or a crank bait or a rip bait. I always like to throw a spinner bait first because anytime I start getting into treble hooks, you have a tendency to lose a few fish. Remember how we were talking about the spotted bass short strike? They short strike reaction baits too. One of the first things I'll do, if I start getting short strikes on a spinner bait, I don't like stinger hooks. It's just personally, I feel that I've taken a weedless bait and made it unweedless. I get hung up a lot with it. So my first remedy for my short strikes on my spinner bait is I'll take the bait, I'll dunk it in the water, I'll take a pair of scissors and I'll trim the skirt off right at the bend of the hook. Right where that hook bends is where I'm going to trim that skirt. So now if that fish comes up and bites at it, chances are he'll get a little bit of that hook and I'll be able to reel him in. If for some reason the fish are just crashing the bait, they're not committing to it, and I still can't get a hook into them, I will put a stinger hook on. But I'll show you a little trick with a stinger hook that'll help your success. 
Normally, when you buy a package of hooks, you get the little Shaughnessy hook, then we'll go and buy some rubber tubing. And what we'll do is we'll cut a little piece of that rubber tubing, we'll put it on the end of that hook, and then we'll slide it on there. Well, what happens is this hook is free swinging. That's the part about the stinger hook I don't like. It's not rigid. If I make a bad cast, hit the bank, chances are that hook is liable to turn around and stay just like that. Or worse yet, it'll be sideways. And when that fish bites it, I feel a lot of times that stinger hook will keep that bait out of that fish's mouth. It'll actually get hung up on the outside of it and push it away. So what I'll do different with the stinger hook, instead of just a little piece of surgical tubing, I'll take a little larger piece and I'll measure that tubing. And I'll measure it from the body of the spinner bait to the back of the hook. And I want this tubing to be about a quarter inch longer than the shank of that hook from this body. I'll insert the stinger hook into the tubing, that extra quarter inch. So that's what it's going to look like. We're going to have it so there's about an inch and a half, two inches of tubing on there. I'm going to thread that tubing onto that spinner bait. And you need to make sure that you go through the eye of the stinger hook. Last thing you want to do is set the hook and come back with no stinger hook. I'll slide that tubing up onto that bait. Now what this has done is this has made that stinger hook rigid. If I make a bad cast, I hit something, that hook bounces back and stays in line. This also keeps that bait semi-weedless. Where before that stinger hook could fall over and get snagged on something, now it keeps it in line and normally I can still bring it through the structure and not get hung up. When I throw reaction baits, I always like to throw them on a fiberglass rod. I believe I land a few more fish because of it. What happens is, with a fiberglass rod, it's very forgiving. It's like a shock absorber. A fish will strike this bait, they actually suck on it, pull it in their mouth. What makes a graphite rod so sensitive is the properties it's made of. Graphite rods actually try to self-right themselves. When you pull on a graphite rod, it has its own nature to want to come back to center. A fiberglass rod does not have that. If I take this rod, set it in the corner, and it has a bend like that, and come back in four or five days, I pick that rod up, it's gonna have a set. It will have a bend on it. A graphite rod won't do that. So what happens is, is I get this fish next to the boat, he's thrashing around, he has a shock absorber, I'm going to be pulling on that fish enough because I'm excited and it's a four pound fish and I'm wanting to get a picture of him. But this fiberglass rod's forgiving, he's letting him thrash around. Unlike a graphite rod, it's trying to pull back and it'll actually tear a bigger hole on the fish. I throw these spinner baits on like a seven foot fiberglass rod. If the water's really clear, I'll throw like 12 pound P line in green, CXX green. If I have a little bit of stain, or if I'm fishing my spinner baits a little shallower, I'll step it up to like 15 pound test. As far as weights and combinations, if I'm fishing, say zero down to 15 foot, I'll throw a half ounce. Anytime that I go past that 15 foot mark, I'll throw like three quarter to one ounce, depending on how deep I'll go. And a lot of times we'll fish spinner baits down to 30 foot. And when we're doing that, we're going to throw a one ounce spinner bait. And normally that type of deal is we're fishing flats or points and we're actually casting out past our target, letting the bait get down to that depth and crashing it into the sides of those points or dredging those flats in 30 foot. One of the other really good reaction baits to throw for spotted bass it's a rip bait. I like to throw rip baits anytime that I see fish suspended. If, if I'm metering, fishing in the area, and I'd like say last week I was catching them in these cuts, 
and I marked all the fish on the bottom and I was going through with my jig and worms and catching them. All of a sudden, this next weekend I go fishing, they're not on the bottom, they're suspended. One of the first things I'll do is I'll start throwing this jerk bait. It's called a jerk bait or a rip bait. Again, I'm going to fish it on a fiberglass rod because it's a reaction bait. It has treble hooks. Normally, I'll replace the treble hooks on stock baits. I like to go like the next size up. I want to throw as large a treble hook on this bait that I can without the hooks getting intertangled, where the hooks can't lap over and hook together. Because I want a biggest gap out there and get as much point exposed for that fish. When I start throwing these jerk baits, what I'll do is I'll cast them out again. I'll throw it right up into the shallows. I'm waiting for those fish to tell me where they are positioned. I'll throw it up. I'll give it like three quick pops. I'll pause it. Very important that you pay attention to your pause. I like to call it hang time. You need to keep track of how long you're letting that bait hang and suspend in the water. Because a lot of times that's going to be the key to tell you what it's going to take to get those fish to strike. I'll throw that bait out there, I'll give it three rips down. Now I'm not going to start off by giving it three more rips. I'm going to take it and just give it a quick little twitch. Because again, that spotted bass, he's like a cat. He's stalking it, he's crouching on it. If he's following that bait, the last thing I want to do is rip it away from him. I want to keep it right in the strike zone. And if he's even thinking about biting it, I just want to give it a little action, just a little twitch. Hopefully he'll commit and bite that bait. If I don't get bit, I'll go back to my three rips. I'll let that bait set and I'll start toying with how long I let it set. A lot of the times you'll get the strike when it's set and dead. All of a sudden your line slack and it takes off. When that happens, just start reeling. Let that fiberglass rod load up, give him a little tug and you'll reel him in. Sometimes the fish, they won't want the bait to set very long at all. I'll toy with it, I'll give it three rips, twitch it. The next time I do it, I'll give it the three rips and I'll let it set a little longer. Then I'll give it the twitch. I'll, I'll mix it up. You just kind of have to mix it up and see what it takes for those fish to strike. As far as colors, Water clarity dictates the color of bait that I'm going to throw. The cleaner the water, the clearer the bait I want. The more natural or translucent the bait. The dirtier the water, the brighter and the louder the bait I want. You, it's really a good technique to cover a lot of water, catch a lot of fish. A lot of times there's nothing funner because I would say probably the majority of the time that I catch fish ripping, it's when the bait is totally stopped. And it's so neat to be able to get out there, make a long cast across the point or in a pocket, jerk that bait down there and just watch that slack line. And sometimes that line won't take off. All you'll see is a little tick, just like a worm strike. And all that fish did was charge up from the deep water and just hang on to it that's when you have to go ahead and swing and get line tension on the line. A lot of people in the winter, they ignore cranking. Cranking for spotted bass can be very useful, very successful at times. Lake Oroville right now, there's a really good crank bite going. We had all those winds going into the tournament. There were certain areas of the lake that were really dirtied up. Those fish would move shallow. They'd bump that spinnerbait around. They really wouldn't commit to it. But the crankbait, if they bump it, a lot of times they'd wear it on the side of their head and we'd get them in. If not, they'd inhale it. When I'm cranking, still I'm gonna use that fiberglass rod. I'm gonna throw like eight or 10 pound test CXXP line. I like using the lighter line. I get a little deeper. I feel my crankbaits have a little more action. What I want to do, what I want to achieve with this crankbait is I actually want to crash it into stuff. And as soon as it crashes into something, I want to stop. And I want to let that bait start floating up. 
As soon as I bump a stump, I'm going to kill it. And a lot of times, just like that rip bait, when that bait starts floating up, they'll snag onto it. Other times, what they'll do is they'll just load up. A lot of times you'll be cranking, you'll be stopping and going, you'll be grinding the bottom, and you'll stop, you'll go a little bit, and then you'll go to crank some, all of a sudden it's like you lost the action on your bait. What's happened is he's grabbed that bait and he's just swimming to you. He's actually letting you tow him a little bit. Anytime you feel anything different with that crankbait, you need to kind of give it a set, just a little swing to the side. And I always fish my crankbaits with my rod pointed at a 90 degree angle off the side. I never throw them going straight on. I've always got it at an angle off to my side. So when I set the hook, I can swing either to my right or my left. Because the last thing I want to do is pull it straight up. Because what happens if that fish is on there, he'll have a tendency to follow it up and he's going to jump and try to throw the bait. One of my favorite crankbaits to throw in the winter is a flat sided crankbait. The reason being is this bait actually gives more of a vibration than a round sided bait. It actually displaces more water when it wobbles which helps draw more strikes, gets more attention to the bait. It also enables me to feel the bait, the action of the bait better. I'm more in tune to what that bait does, and if one does hop on it and doesn't have a vicious strike, I know that I've lost the action, kind of like a spinner bait, and I'll set the hook. As far as colors, I do the same thing. The cleaner the water, the more natural color of the bait. The dirtier the water, the louder the bait. This particular bait I was throwing, I was in a creek arm. We had a little bit of rain runoff and it was kind of muddied up a little bit. I could throw a bait that was kind of brownish and I wouldn't get bit. But as soon as I threw the same bait that had a little orange, something bright on it, I started getting bites. So those are a couple of the things that kind of helped me catch a few more spotted bass. Hopefully you can take them out to the water and have success with them too. One thing to remember, even in the winter that you're catching a lot of fish, doesn't mean that there's a million of them out there. Still always practice catch and release. You know, because it is a unique fishery, we do have the opportunity to go out there any day of the week in the winter and catch anywhere from 10 to 30 or 40 bass. They're really a neat fish. Well, I appreciate your attention. I hope you folks enjoy the sports show. And uh, if you have any other questions, I'll be right here at the bottom of the tank and I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Want me to point?